for choosing a front end framework on the schedule, uh, you're in the right place. I shorten it to choosing a JavaScript framework. We're talking about the client side JavaScript frameworks to be the most specific. Uh, if you want to find me on the internet, uh, my handle is Pamathor. It goes with my dinosaur themed website, The Web of War. Uh, and I also podcast with Turing and Complete, and we have a cool URL of Turing.cool. And if you get the joke about Turing and Complete, you'll probably like the podcast. So, the reason I'm giving this talk is we, we wrote this book. So, I wrote this book with three fantastic co authors who really did more of a, a deep dive into the three ubiquitous frameworks. Uh, for client-side JavaScript. And so what we do in that is we go through each of the frameworks, pros and cons, lots of examples. And so I'm going to, that's what the plan is for the talk today. And so the spoiler is I'm not going to tell you what to do. Unfortunately, nothing is that easy. But what we will do, however, is hopefully go through each of the major frameworks with some, uh, a little bit more content in some of the more emerging frameworks, which Polymer and React are becoming more serious contenders nowadays. Uh, so we're somehow going to do all of this in 40-ish minutes uh, in a hope that you can make a more informed choice for a project, for learning, for whatever reason you're here. If you're a developer who's curious about client-side frameworks, if you're a manager who has herds of developers trying to change your framework every week, uh, maybe this will give you a little bit more information about the major frameworks that are out there. So I'll talk about what I mean when I say JavaScript framework, why we use them, talk, go through each of the major frameworks with some background, pros, cons, example code, and we'll go through Polymer and React as well, and some framework evaluation techniques if you're interested in some of the little more pedagogical perspective that I enjoy. So what do we say when we talk about frameworks? So a framework a long time ago in a browser not that long ago, uh, people made web apps, so that's not that different than now. However, uh, there wasn't one way, also still true. But the result <laughs> is that there was kind of this, what you would call a zeitgeist, so a spirit of the times. So if you look at the, I find the, you know, the way we progress through computing really interesting. And so these frameworks, Backbone, Ember, Angular, they emerged all around the same time. Uh, and it's because you talk to, to framework developers, it's that they were doing the same thing over and over again. And that is a, you say, well, why are we keep doing the same thing over and over again? We should standardize it. Uh, and so you might be familiar with this comic uh, as the, that, you know, ah, we shall standardize it, and then you get n more standards. And that's kind of the, the world we're in today with JavaScript frameworks. It feels like there's new JavaScript frameworks all the time. It feels like it's hard to keep up. But I still would say that JavaScript frameworks are a very good thing because you shouldn't have to write a router. So I use that as my shorthand for there's kind of this figure that 85% of what you're doing in your computing stack is pretty common, and it's going to be pretty common with every other application that's similar to yours. But 15% of it is where you're adding value. So that's kind of what you want to think about is in your business or your product, where are you adding value? Where do you want to spend your time? Probably, by, like, probably writing your business logic uh, for how you're you know, producing value for your customers or what have you. So think about where you want to spend your time, and that is why frameworks are so popular, is because they, you adopt a community-powered solution to solve that problem for you. And especially in the open source world, you're adopting a solution that is, is community-super-powered, so you can, if you write your own framework, you have your team. If you use an open source framework, you have that whole community to talk to, to debug, resources, all that great thing you get from using other people's code trade-offs, but that's what it is. The major frameworks will go through Backbone, Angular, Ember, overview strengths and weaknesses, and a little code. Backbone. So Backbone comes from so Document Cloud and a Rails background. I find that interesting, and especially if you're familiar with Rails, you'll look at these and these things will it'll start to, you'll see a little familiar, uh, similar patterns. Uh, so Backbone could be considered the core of an application, and I would call it unopinionated. What do I mean when I say opinionated? <laughs> so opinionated would mean I know I'm going really fast, <laughs> um, but so opinionated would mean that there's an obvious or best practices driven solution to the problem. So the difference between opinionated and unopinionated. So unopinionated would mean that more of a choose your own adventure type situation. So if you're in a situation where you want some structure, but you don't want it to be really didactic, you want more of an unopinionated situation. And if you, if you still want to abstract some things away, if you don't want to abstract anything away, then you should be writing your own thing. Assuming you want to abstract some of it away, unopinionated solution. 
What you get in Backbone, you get core MVC components. I use MVC. MVC is used to describe client-side frameworks. They aren't really MVC, but we'll, for the purposes of drawing parallels to what we might do on a server side, that's why we end up saying MVC. And you get a nudge in an event-driven application design. If you're doing Backbone right, if there is a right way to do it, it's more event-driven. Dependencies, you've got underscore, which is like a utility belt for JavaScript, uh, very useful. You probably want to have it anyway. jQuery, which you're probably familiar with, or an alternative. I would say its strength is that it's unopinionated. And because it's unopinionated, it means that you can integrate well with many other libraries in the back end. If you get two opinionated things talking to each other, they are going to clash. And that's going to happen. And so Backbone has that strength in that it can integrate well with other backends and provide you a little bit of structure. Um, you can even use Backbone with React and things like that. Um, and the event system. I really love their event system. Weaknesses are that it's unopinionated. Uh, and you get into the, that'd be your problem situation. So if you say, how, what is the backbone way to do this? What is the backbone way to solve this problem? And there probably, there isn't one happy path solution. That could be a positive thing for some people, it's a negative thing. So what you get when you have backbone, you get models, views, collections, routing. And we're gonna go through a basic model and view setup so you'll actually get to see some sample backbone code. So the examples in this presentation outside of emerging frameworks and some of the Ember stuff because it's been updated for 2.0 or 2.0. Uh, so this is, is from, from the book. And so it's the theory is of there's properties like in a realtor app. And so that's kind of the conceit behind this. So if we create a property, we get this, this backbone model, this laser pointer, um, backbone model that extends. So this nice extend syntax. And these are really, the happy, unhappy thing about backbone models is they're really giving you that object constructor syntax in JavaScript that it's really not that hard to do it yourself, but the, it gives you a, a common interface so that you are like other backbone apps and you just do it in the same way, and there's benefits of that. And so if we want to create a view, we use a similar extend syntax. We've got that super class, that backbone view, like we have backbone model. And we extend and we give it some properties. We give it a tag name, that's an HTML tag name, class name to attach to that. Makes it simple to change these things later if necessary. Uh, and the render function for rendering the view. In Backbone, the render function is just a function. So like I said, like with the objects, you can arbitrarily add things to the object. With the render function, you can do whatever you want. And so this is one of those anti-patterns you sometimes see in Backbone. It doesn't have a lot of structure around preventing you from doing silly things, um, but that means if you if you know what you want to do, then it's not going to get in your way. And then you return this in order to. There's a, a good pattern in backbone views where you get chaining, which is really nice. So you always return this is a pattern in the render function. So if we're using a view in the model, let's say we create a property, we create a property view and attach the model to it. So down there, model my house, and then render the view and then attach the view to the document body. And then it would look something like this if we had a, it had a template and rendered the properties into it. So you also get collections. So the collections are groups of models. So uh, if, you, if that <laughs> might sound familiar from Rails syntax, uh, then you, you are correct. Uh, router, which is read and write the URL without reloading the page, which was one of the most annoying things to write in JavaScript applications yourself. So it's really nice to use, use a community supported router that is, is well known and uh, easy easy to understand. Events, the views trigger updates the model, vice versa, nice event system, core component of Backbone. If you want to learn more about Backbone, I would suggest the Backbone tutorials, conveniently named. Uh, Adios Mani's Backbone Fundamentals is also really good. And also, in terms of Backbone being kind of the, the least opinionated of the frameworks, uh, I really like reading and recommend reading the annotated source if you're interested in this. It also, it's really, if you're curious how something works, their annotated source actually helps you understand how the thing is working, which is so helpful. And especially if you have con when you have concerns about using other people's code, having an annotated source that's really well written, really well documented, is a really big benefit. All right, on with Angular. So Angular is still the fastest growing JavaScript framework. So there's a lot of hype around React, but Angular is still more popular in the wild, is higher in adoption, and it's still, it's still more popular on, on GitHub if that's a measure of anything. Um, and the, if you described it in, in two basic bullets, it would be that you write behavior in your markup, 
known as directives. So uh, some of the Angular, Angular terminology gets very fancy. Uh, it doesn't have to be, but it, it is. So they're called directives. And it has Google backing. So when Angular started gaining popularity, it benefited a lot from the, the Google hype machine of sorts. So you know, there's, there was a keynote earlier today that was talking about Google infrastructure for everyone else. And there's just kind of this shorthand for, oh, well, if it's happening at Google, then maybe we should look at it. And so uh, the Angular framework has benefited from that. So you get strongly defined building components, those directives, which are pretty much a big, the big deal, uh, controllers and services. You get two-way data binding, so this is different from, from Backbone. So two-way data binding to that, the, the brilliant demo that you might have seen of where you type in one box and it's automatically bound to another source of data, and it just works. Uh, dependency injection, which is really great for testing. So saying, I'm gonna use, uh, I know exactly what I'm using in each part of the application, because we, in JavaScript, we also tend to have a scope problem where things bleed everywhere and it can cause really nasty problems. There's also some great auxiliary tools and these are not just Angular based, but they did come from the Angular world and so I, I mentioned them here. Uh, Karma being a unit testing tool and Protractor being a, and more of an end-to-end -end testing tool, which are really great for Karma for JavaScript applications in general, Protractor for single page web apps in general, fantastic testing tools. Dependencies, none, uh, but it does load its, load its own smaller jQuery, uh, and if you have your own copy, it will use that if it's 2.1 uh, and up. So I would say the strengths of, of Angular are that it has a short or low context setup. It's actually really quick to get started in Angular from a opening a text file and adding some things. It has a long feature list, so you, it's a pretty tight framework in terms of size, but you get a lot when you load it in. It's also module friendly, meaning for writing your own modules, but also for using other people's modules, so, which is a, a very, very good and popular thing for sharing packages and being able to, to share the code that you write among multiple applications or with other developers. And of course, the, the major industry backing. So, yeah, uh, weaknesses. So the recent rise to prominence, and of course, this will be less true over time by the definition of it, uh, is less time in production. So. This is, this is, you know, the a criticism of client-side frameworks is how, how have you scaled it, how do you understand how well it works, um, but it's by the nature of the beast, this will be less true of the time. Uh, this, you have high lock-in with writing behavior and markup, so it's going to be difficult once you, because it's, it's a, a very big paradigm change. So once you started writing behavior in your markup, it's not going to be that easy to move to something else that has no idea what you're doing. So that's the nature of having a big paradigm shift. There's also some skeptics of the future roadmap, Google backing. Um, there, wa there was a talk just in here about Angular 2, um, and so there's a lot of nervousness around that. There's also nervousness about abandonware, and especially with, with 1.3, uh, the, that version dropped IE8 support, which for some people who had, this happened to some people I knew, they had adopted Angular specifically because it was one of the only client-side frameworks that had IE8 support, and they have to support international customers who are using IE. And now they're worried that they have abandonware. So how are they gonna support this framework themselves? Is there gonna be a community a standard of practice around it? Um, or are they just gonna enter the, the wild land of forking projects? Is that what's gonna to happen to them? So there's concerns about abandonware from, from that version and for the future. So those key components you get, you get modules, directives, services, controllers. And so we'll go through kind of what each one of them looks like. So a module looks like this. So this is the simplest module. Every Angular app has at least one or more module definitions um, because your, your app itself is a, is a module. And so this is how easy it is to define an Angular app. It's fast to get up and running, and so it, makes, it does make Angular really good for interactive prototyping because you get to write your, uh, your uh, code right into your HTML. So for prototyping, that can be really appealing. And those uh, square brackets, the array, um, that is your dependency injection. So here, this is a, an empty array. It doesn't have any dependencies yet. Um, but you can consider dependency injection kind of like where you would use require.js or you know, thing, common JS, where you declare what you need before you're going to use it. So this is a simple directive. This is my favorite directive example because it creates the unicorn directive. Uh, and this restrict E is where you're saying it's an element. And, uh, Spoilers, we're gonna talk about web components a little later. Um, so this is a lot like this. So direct is kind of a fancy word for a web component-ish. Um, and so this 
all this does, it's very simple. It makes unicorn the HTML for that element, and then you can use it of unicorn, closing bracket unicorn. So less common than, more common than creating a unicorn directive is more commonly you'll modify the behavior of the DOM using a lot of, there's a lot of built-in directives. So if you see something in the markup, chances are good that it's a directive. So ng init is a directive, so this is saying I'm gonna initialize with some data, ng repeat is a directive, and when you see these curly braces, this is how you're doing data binding in Angular. So services are, are useful in, in Angular, and they were, they're a big deal for, for what they do, especially for the JavaScript ecosystem. So you get a singleton to inject into any Angular component, and so again, with the, the high-level language often used in Angular. So singleton just means that, especially in JavaScript, it's really easy to accidentally create the same thing over and over again, which is really unfortunate because you're just burning memory and you're wasting space. So a singleton, it says, ah, well, I'm, I, once I have created it, I'm done, and I have created it. That's great. And it's also lazily instantiated, which means that when you use you, you don't use it until you use it. And so it's lazy. So it's just, it's there, you've written the code for it, but it's not gonna be instantiated until you use it, which has some benefits in load time and uh, that kind of thing. And yes. And so you use your services to house business logic and to do the kind of separation of concern. So this is, this service is rather than writing data into ng init, we're gonna create a service to load our data for us and uh, return the, the data to us. The controllers augment scope. So scope is like this super object in Angular. And so you can, you can do not great things to scope. Uh, there's not a lot of, my friend calls it foot guns, uh, like when you shoot yourself in a foot. <laughs> there's not pr much prevention of foot guns in terms of adding things to scope. Uh, but ideally you're doing it in the, in the controller. So you're, you're augmenting scope and you attach, attach data to the scope. And scope means that you can pass it to the view. So that's the scope. So in this, we say, okay, we're gonna do scope.properties equals properties, those realtor properties, and so now we can use it in the view. And so if we use it in the view, it looks like this. Uh, they augment scope and bind to the view, so ng controller is that property controller now. And then we use other directives to do that, ng repeat, we do the data binding, and uh, even the, the ng href in order for this to, to resolve the a proper URL. Uh, so, controllers pass the data into the scope for the view. So other components very useful in Angular, you've got filters. There's a lot of useful filters in there for just simple things like currency, uh, you know, time, uh, things that make your life a bit easier. So being able to pass data through a filter in a useful way. And of course you can define your own filters. Animations, there's some nice animations that come ship with Angular. Internationalization, localization, accessibility with ng area, and I already mentioned the testing tools. So really you get, you get quite a lot when you adopt Angular. The big caveat is Angular 2, which um, you're probably overqualified if you attended the last talk, but maybe you'll enjoy the other frameworks. Um, but uh, it's a complete rewrite with no backwards compatibility. Uh, so when you hear about, oh, Angular, that sounds so great, right? Oh, and then Angular 2 is gonna blow up the party. Not necessarily true. Um, there's a, an ng comp video that people recommend uh, called Angular 1 meets Angular 2. And so that can help, it kind of is discussing the how you can have a happy path if you're on 1 and moving to 2. Uh, and also Angular version 1.4 has a new router which will allow you to update your code incrementally to 2.0. Uh, and of course the, one of the other reasons people are very intimidated by Angular 2 is that it's, it's kind of dictating that you will use TypeScript or the ES6 syntax, which is more people are adopting it, but when you use Angular 2, it's going to be expected that you will do it. So resources, the, the Angular docs themselves are really good. So the guide, the API, the tutorial, uh, it's really well documented. The language can be a, a little bit, uh, you feel like you have to have a PhD in computer science sometimes. Um, that can be an outside, but in general, it, there's a lot of documentation. And other resources outside of that are Egghead, Egghead.io. If you have not checked this out and you're interested in JavaScript frameworks in general, fantastic resources, not just Angular, but that's kind of where they started. Uh, and it's a subscription service that people really like. Uh, also, Angular Air is a, a free live video podcast. Uh, that's, that's pretty good. All right, Ember. So Ember is the most complete JavaScript framework. So when I say complete, I mean, it's, it, I would say it's highly opinionated. And 
It's built completely on modular open source components, so good news for, for this crowd. And it's community super powered. Uh, there's also, if you are intrigued by Ember after this, there's a, a talk tomorrow at the same time slot on Ember. So what you get, uh, you get very strongly defined components. You get data binding, so singular. Uh, you get Ember components, which are like directives, which are like web components. We'll do a short teaser on that. Uh, and you get great routing support. The, the Ember router is really good and dependency injection. So it seems like the feature list kind of maps really well to Angular, but it takes a, a very, a pretty different approach, I would say. So the entry path to, to Ember now is Ember CLI, so the command line interface. And you also get debugging tools with Ember and Vector should you choose to use it. It's a very useful tool. So dependency, since Ember CLI is now the entry point for getting started with Ember, they've kind of, if you look at the documentation, they've kind of swept away uh, other things and just said, just use the CLI and it will do a lot of work for you. And so by the nature of that, your dependencies are now just Node and NPM, uh, and that's because you're gonna use that to install the CLI. So the strengths is that it's community, it's really community superpowers. They produce a lot of content, people are really active. Um, I, I don't foresee any kind of abandonware in Ember. Uh, and it's convention driven, so there is kind of a, a right way to do things and there's commonalities with every other Ember app. So if you, if you start writing in Ember and you talk to other people who write Ember, there should be some sort of common language that you're talking about. And you also get generation and tools and templates with the CLI tool. So sometimes there's too much information. This is a very great problem to have. If you look at the Ember documentation, there is a lot of it. There's a lot of guides and a lot of words. Um, and the fact that, there, that there's also been some changes moving from the one version to two version, it can sometimes be confusing to figure out. They're, they're, they're quite similar and it's a pretty happy path, but it can be a little hard to figure out if something is the one way or the two way. And also because there's a the right way to do things, that means a higher learning curve. So trying to figure out, if you can figure out one way to do things, then you spend you know three times as long trying to figure out if it was the right way to do it. And so this can be, this can be intimidating to beginners. And it's also not as pervasive as the other two major frameworks. This can be concerned. Honestly, I don't think it's that big of a deal. People are often trying to say like, well, so what's the one true framework? And the answer is there's not one. Um, Ember is great. All, all of them are great. They're really largely adopted. Uh, and you know, if you like it, you'll have a good time. So the key components, we've got templating by handlebars, so open source projects, uh, models, routes, components, and controllers. So controllers are still part of Ember, but they will eventually be phased out in favor of components because anything you can do in a controller, you can probably figure out how to do in a component. And the only reason is right now you can't route to a component directly. And so the, what they say in the documentation is that when that changes, it will be recommended to replace all controllers with components. <coughs> so we'll get started, look at routes, models, and components. So uh, as I said, the entry path now is straight up is Ember CLI. So you install globally Ember CLI, then you get the Ember command line tool and uh, all these keywords. Um, and so new, new app. This is gonna probably remind you of Rails. It reminds me a lot of Rails. And so you change directory into that app and then you, you can run a server right away. And so what that command line tool does is it actually, like, it sets up your project. So this is when we say highly opinionated and that there's a right way to do things. It's highly opinionated and there's a right way to do things. It gives you a folder structure and a recommended way of doing things. And if you do think, if you put things in the right folder, lots of you know, magic can happen, that it, it just works and it knows what to do. Uh, so if you like that kind of environment, then Ember is the place for you to go. So once you have that, it loads all your dependencies. It even loads Git, which I really like. So it's, it's kind of nudging people into uh, positive development practices. Uh, and it's ready to go. If you can run the server right away and it, it runs and it just works. And so with that you can, with just like a few static assets, it's you, then you have the server running, you have, a web, you have a web app. And so using, so pretty much all these things are gonna use the Ember CLI to generate. So routes are first class citizen in Ember. And so the, so in this, we can actually, with this model example, it, we actually didn't have to create a separate model for this. Ember is smart enough to say, oh, okay, you loaded some well-formed JSON. I'm gonna assume that you want me to turn each of those into an object that has properties of that JSON. 
Like it's, it's JavaScript, it's JSON, it's, it knows what to do with it. Um, you'll also notice that this is, this is the ES6 syntax, um, but it's not that big a deal in Ember, especially because you get those code generation tools. So once you're dropped into that context and things are already wired for you, it's pretty easy to adopt that syntax if you aren't familiar with it. So, yeah, I think we already covered that. Um, so if you want to define a model, you can Ember generate model. So you'll see this link, so Ember generate, uh, and then whatever core component of Ember you, it's hard to use the word component because then there's also web components, so we gotta find a new word. Um, but so this, the name of it, and then the attributes and the types of what they should be. And so in this, DS is a data store. And so we import DS and then we create a model that assigns those properties to those data values. It's, it does the generation for you, but then it's still really easy to understand when you look at it, which is a really good thing. So web components, so the Ember components are like web components, and that means that they contain a template for presentation and markup, and behavior via JavaScript. So we're going to take a short detour, which we will then come back to in a very short minutes. And so web components, what they are, they're comprised of multiple standards that are not yet implemented across browsers. Uh, so there's these, these four, four standards, and webcomponents.org has some more information on it, but we'll, again, we'll, we'll resume the detour in a minute. So if we want to create a component, we use that Ember generate thing in Ember, and we give the name of it. So they have to have dashes is the law, so that you won't ever, you know, interact with another future HTML element if HTML is ever going to create a, you know, my component element. Uh, and then I use the dash dash pod. That argument puts your puts your component stuff together, which I, I prefer. So then it goes into components slash my component, and they see these are in the same directory, which is maps more to how you do web components as well. Um, if you don't use the pod, it's fine. I mean, it still works. It will just put the behavior and components, and the template will be in the templates folder. It's also understandable, but I like to put like things together. So if I were to give you some Ember resources, the guys, they are, there's lots of them, but they are very good. And Ember Watch is kind of more of a, an aggregator site. If you're looking for tutorials, if you're looking for news, uh, Ember Watch is going to be a place for you to hang out. And I'd also recommend, uh, well, especially I asked a friend what he would recommend, and he recommended the Ember CLI 101, especially now that Ember CLI is the entry point to making Ember apps. It behooves you to understand this tool really well. And so the Ember CLI book gives you that kind of information. All right, so rising stars. So we're going to talk about Polymer first so that we can talk about web components. And so you might also want to see X tags from Mozilla. Um, how many of you have heard of Polymer? I'm sorry to do a hand raising thing. Ah, excellent. Okay. So, so yeah, so if you've heard of Polymer, um, you might not have heard of X tags, uh, which is the, is the web component project from Mozilla. But they are definitely related, um, but we'll talk about Polymer here. So the detour is now resumed. So these specs are in working graph. So you've got custom elements, HTML imports, templates, and shadow DOM. So those are the, the four specs that you can consider to make up web components. And the standard way of using them is to use the web components JS polyfills, which is nice that there's, there's now kind of a, a standard polyfill that most of these projects are using. So they're using web components JS as their polyfill under the hood. And the difference, so the commonality between Polymer and Xtag and so if you want to, if you're saying, okay, well, Web Components is a standard, so then what is Polymer? It's a question. And so Polymer is kind of to Web Components as jQuery is to the DOM. It's, it's more of a, it's an abstraction interface. It makes it easier to use, theoretically. Uh, and so it, it makes it easier for you to get started. So the question is, with any emerging web standard, are we componentized yet? Uh, there is a lot of green on here. However, you'll note that this is a flag. This is a flag. Uh, this is empty, <laughs> so um, so support is not is not common. Uh, you there is polyfill, of course, so you can otherwise this, you, you wouldn't be able to use it at all. Um, but there is not ubiquitous support. So if we're defining a Polymer component, first we have to import uh, Polymer as a dependency. Let's say this is my component HTML, and so we're going to put that markup and that behavior together. So we can create our template. And in the template, we include our styles. 
for rendering our, our component within that scope uh, and, the, and the markup that you want to use. And then we use the, the script tag inside that element and use the polymer and we say is my component to tell it that what polymer elements a polymer will then create the component for us. Uh, and this is where we'd add extra behavior uh, such as an, an, interfa an application interface uh, in order to, for example, so if you think of web components, if you, it sounds like a lot of you have heard of them. Um, I think of it like the select tag. Like the select tag is a, an HTML element that has a really known and solid API. It has a interface, like it has a presentation. There is a way that a, the select tag, the drop down, how it looks and how you get data out of it via JavaScript. So that's what you can do in Polymer. Uh, in web components is that you can define that interface on, you can define presentation, you can define how you get data in and out of it, and you can define all that in your own element. And so this is just showing that, so we pass that name equals my component all the way through to is my component, and then we can use that my component, my component, which looks similar to directives, looks similar to, to Ember components. So if you, if you bet on one thing, you might want to consider betting on that something's happening with web components. So resources, the Polymer docs are, are good. There's also an email list if you're into that. Uh, the Polymer Slack, so Slack, the chat instance, and the Polymer podcast. And then there's also more links, uh, and these slides will, will go online because I, I know you all are also at the bottom, so it's going to be hard for people in the back to see. Um, but those, those links are actually from my, my, my friend JB, who's on the, the Polymer podcast. So I asked him for resources, and he threw a lot at me. So there's there's more in there if you're interested. So React, so React covers only the view layer. So they, they pitch themselves as we're the V and MVC. And the, the way React works is it uses, as actually one of those web component specifications. And so it uses the shadow DOM, it uses a polyfill for it. And it's super performant, which is kind of how it's been popularized as it, it makes view rendering really fast. And the way it does that is that you can consider it, I think of it like git diffs for browser rendering. That instead of mutating the DOM, which is expensive, uh, we, what React does is diff and see what has changed and then only touch the things that have changed. So if you can reduce the number of times you touch the DOM, you get better performance is the, 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 the idea of React. So this React component example is lovingly taken from the React tutorial. Uh, so this is the bare comments box. You get React create class. There's a render function. So remember, it kind of looks like a backbone view, right? Um, so we've got a render function. And then we render some stuff. And then we React DOM render that element. You might have noticed that, oh my goodness, there's some HTML in my JavaScript. Yes, uh, so that is called JSX. So it's not HTML, it's, it's XML in, in, your, in your React. And when React came out, this was one of the parts of React that people were really, really resistant to. And they, they said, why, you know, which is kind of funny because we let JavaScript come into our DOM with, with Angular, but then when we went the other way, there's a lot of resistance. Um, but so people were like, what are you doing? We've done all our lives to prevent this from happening. Um, but now people like it. And so if you are interested in React, I highly suggest going with it. And going and just going with that path and seeing how uh, JSX works out for you. So you, I, I now can't mention React without mentioning Flux. So Flux is an architecture pattern. It is not a framework. It is an architecture pattern. There are implementations of this architecture pattern that you can use. Um, unfortunately, you have the, the tragedy of you know the dilemma, the paradox of choice, <laughs> dilemma, paradox, so many choices of Flux implementations. So if you are using React because it's, you know, it's the view layer, and so in terms of a framework, it's not giving you that much around how you're going to structure your application. So it, you're, you're rendering views, but that's just rendering your views. What are you doing with all your data? What are you doing with everything else? Flux is a suggested architecture for that. Um, you can look up, but some of the most popular ones are Redux, which builds upon Flux and also takes some inspiration from the Elm language, which is really really interesting and pretty cool. Uh, and, and Reflux is also another one. And it's, it's also hard because they, they all sound alike. <laughs> and, but it, it's pretty interesting to look into. I definitely recommend the, the ideal path if, you know, with unlimited time would be to write your own Flux implementation 
so you understand it, and then forget about that and use someone else's that's community supported in an ideal world of unlimited time. But so it is. And then OM is, a, is React with ClojureScript, and this is also one of the tools that helped popularize React, actually, which these demos of really interesting things you could do with a really limited, limited amount of code. So with, with ClojureScript, the Lisp language that you can write a little bit of code to get a lot of, uh, a lot of behavior. So some, some resources, there's a newsletter if you're into newsletters, there's podcasts. Uh, of course, there's the React documentation as well. Um, there, there was a Slack instance, uh, but it is now closed because they had over 8,000 members and Slack said, no, we actually can't support unlimited free groups. Uh, so I understand that that was cool, but they're looking for a new home for the chat room in case you can help. Um, but there's lots of resources and a lot of excitement around React. All right, so evaluating frameworks. So uh, if I were to give a choosing a, a front end framework talk and did not mention to do MVC, I should be fired. Uh, but to do MVC.com is a, a website that gives you examples of so a simple application written in many frameworks. So you can say, how would I write, so a to do a you know, checklist app, how would I write that in Angular, React, um, Dojo, uh, there's a few on there, and the, the website will look different now because it's, it's constantly updating. Um, so it's pretty interesting to see uh, end to end of, a, of a, a very simple application so you can look under the hood and see how it goes. If you're interested in some of the pedagogy, uh, there's a, a spreadsheet for ranking that, that I designed a, a couple years ago. I gave a talk on choosing a, a framework in general, so not just JavaScript frameworks. Uh, and I worked on a way to rank frameworks according to business, technical, and team criteria. And then after that, uh, the people at the Wharton School took that and created a much better, awesome, if you're looking for a more formal and vetted solution on, I'm, you know, I'm an organization that wants to vet our technology in a, in a, you know, in a systematic way. They created this dev tab, which is pretty neat and gives you a way to do that. So that you can look at a technology and weigh it against these scales and see how, how it'll help you. So, and dev tab is the, is the Wharton Software Development Technology Assessment Process. All right, somehow, I don't know how I got through all of these, but it's because I talked really fast. So we actually probably do have some time for questions, but I mean, it's also okay to end early because it's lunch. So, so thank you very much. Um, yeah. <laughs>